praise the Lord. I'm lost without you. You know, until everyone comes to know that, they'll never get saved. Amen. Lost without him. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, let me get turned on here. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. The problem with sin. The problem with sin. Joshua chapter 7. You know, in our text, nothing is left of Jericho but smoking rubble and the ashes. The people of that city are all dead and the spoils were all to be dedicated to the Lord. Personally keeping the values from the victory at Jericho was expressly, expressively forbidden. And the riches and the bounty of that place were to be placed in the Lord's treasure. It's the principle of the first fruit found throughout the Bible. It says that the first of everything belongs to God. The tenth, the ten percent of our income is a part of that principle. But God should always get the first fruit of, not only of our treasures but of ourselves too. And when we give God the first fruit, we are recognizing his provisions. That he provides the means and the energy and the ability to live and to work and to prosper. And we are also recognizing his power. Only God has the power to take 90% and make it go further than 100% could have ever gone. Yeah. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, start tithing and you'll see. Amen. The next day Israel needs to finish off a little nearby village, not a great walled city like Jericho, Ai it is, is so small that Joshua's captains recommend that they just take a small army to do the job. But no sooner than they invade the uh, they start sensing that God's presence was not with them. And up until this point, God had been fighting for them and giving them the victories, but not today. No, not today. Today, 36 men will die, and the name of the Lord will also be disgraced. Why? Because there was sin in the camp. A soldier had stolen some things that had been given to the tabernacle that had been set apart and devoted to God into his service. And the soldier's name was Achan. His very name means trouble. He, he is known as the man who brought trouble upon Israel. The trouble he caused had far-reaching consequences. His sin affected the whole community of Israel. It caused the first military defeat of God's people. And the gladness of victory was soon replaced by the gloom of defeat. All this because of the disobedience of one man. So this story has much to teach about the devastating effects of sin. What is the problem with our sin? If no one knows about them but us, ask David. My desire in preaching this message is that, is that each of you would search your uh, hearts and examine your life this morning. If there's anything in your life that you have been hiding away, anything that you think is covered and gone, I want you to get that thing settled with the Lord today. Amen. Before you leave this building, follow along with me, with me as I read chapter 7. Yes, the whole chapter. It says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the first thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the, and, it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto she uh, Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the heart of the people melted and became as water. 
And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon the face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide. And he and the elders of the Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at our all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelled on the other side, Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turned their backs before their enemy? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall inverse us around and cut off our name from the earth and wilt, what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the cursed thing, and have also stolen, and disassembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus shall the Lord of God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. Is, O Israel, thou canst not stand before thy enemy until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken of the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by the tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family uh, of that uh, of the Zarahites, Zarahites, and he brought the family of the Zarahites man by man. And Zebedai was taken, and he brought and he brought his household man by man. And Achan the son of Camar, uh, Camari. And the son of Zebdi, the son of Zar, Zar, uh, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And when I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 uh, uh, shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan and the sons of Zebrah and the silver and the garments and the wedge of gold and his son and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and buried them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they rose over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the day. We thank you for the hour. We thank you for your word. We thank you most of all for your cross and your love. God be with us today. Again, I pray if one's lost today, they come to know you. Maybe today there's an aching in our midst. Maybe somebody today is hiding a sin. Maybe they've been saved for a long time, but yet their heart is not right. Sin has invaded their lives. And Father, I pray they get it right before it brings destruction, heartache, trouble into their lives, into their families, and also.
also into this church. God, sin is serious business. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sin is serious business. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my brother back there, Todd, called me and said, you know what? I said, I've been reading in, in the Old Testament. said, God didn't play, did he? I said, no, he didn't. But thank God we're living in a time of grace. But I want to tell you something. Payday's coming. Payday's coming. The problem with sin, my first point is this, an unexpected defeat. An unexpected defeat to a, con, uh, to a confident people. In, in the first six chapters of Israel, Israel was unstoppable. They were, they were a machine just steamrolling along. A river floods, at flood stage uh, uh, was unable to stop them. Just one foot touched the water and boom, there the water's dried up for miles. Walls marched around for seven days and shouted and boom, those walls fell and the people all inside were killed. For the first six chapters, victory and progress, nothing could stop them. Not nature, not armies, not walls, no hurdles, nothing to hinder them. And here they are still basking in the glow of, their, of these great events and they are sure that they are unbeatable. They are certain that every obstacle in their path will be moved out of their way. They, they, they looked at little AI and they felt that, boy, that little old town would be nothing. We'll just send a little old army over there and we'll just wipe them off the face of the earth. Israel did not realize it, but they were living through one of the most dangerous times in life and of life. The time just after a great spiritual victory is a dangerous time. Often like Israel, we will be confident or overconfident in our abilities and believe that we can handle things after God has gave us a great victory. We'll think, you know what, everything's going smooth, we'll just, we'll just keep going, but we, we fail somewhere. Israel was a confident people, but a closer look reveals that they had confidence that was misplaced. Confidence is a good thing as long as, as one's confidence is in the right place. And when we are walking with our Lord and we are, we're, we're walking with our hope and our confidence in the Lord, we will be victorious. But when our confidence is in our own abilities and in our own power, our flesh, they will be uh, uh, destined to fail, I promise you. Right. Joshua sent out some men to spy Ai. And they reported that Ai had only a small army, suggesting only just a few, uh, a few 2,000 or 3,000. You know, we're going to go. That's all that's going to be necessary. We're going to wipe out that place. Kind of boastful, isn't it? Again, note that the report of the spies was full of self-confidence. These people were, 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 were guilty of resting in their worlds. When Israel went up to Ai, they suffered a terrible defeat. They were, they were back before lunch. I'm sure that the people there in Israel saw them coming, and they saw them carrying something and said, oh, that's got to be the spool of Ai. They done whipped them, but to their surprise, when they got back, it was 36 dead bodies, Israelite bodies. They were wondering what happened. To their amazement, they had failed. They had been whipped. They had been humiliated. They had been spanked. That little bitty town. This must have been a very devastating to the Israelites. And it was. You know, we can get caught up in what God has done for us in the past. We forget we still need to fully rely on him today. Amen. 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 If we don't fully realize that we need God every day, we can, we can end up stepping in that hole. We can end up stumbling over that stumbling block in our lives. So we better have the Lord every day. Yes. Nowhere in this passage does it even hint that Joshua and the people of Israel sought the will of God dealing with Ai. Mm. <laughs> Is that not us sometimes? Amen. Is that not just like us sometimes? We just jump right on out there and we got this, right? <laughs> they didn't even pray about the matter. Apparently, he acted entirely on his own, beaming with self-confidence because they had just whipped that big old Jericho with those massive walls. They come falling down and they whip those people. Look at little old AI. Oh, my goodness, this will be no problem. You know, if they would have went to God, 
I believe with all my heart God would have revealed to them that there was a problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. I believe God would reveal to Joshua that there was something wrong. Joshua, you better not go. There's, pro there's trouble in the tribe, in the camp of Israel. Joshua, we got to get this matter straightened out. How many times are we guilty of jumping ahead of the Lord and His will? We will rush headlong into, into life and expect the Lord to bail us out when we make a mess of it, don't we? Yeah. How many times has that not been everybody in this room? Right. How many times have you not stepped out on your own? How many times have you not jumped out and you made a mess of things and then you go to God? Lord, please clean up my mess. Yeah. Amen. Many of our personal failures could be avoided if we first took our plans and our concerns to God in prayer. Wouldn't it? You've heard me say it. A lot of times you wouldn't have to bother me if you talked to God first. Amen. That's right. You wouldn't have to call me up. Preacher, I'm in this situation. I need your prayer. <laughs> I don't mind praying for you, but if you talk to God to start with, you might not need to call me. I mean, I might have been taking a nap or something. <laughs> Just joking. I don't nap here. <laughs> You ask my wife. Uh, just, Sunday. just Sunday sometimes. <laughs> Note that they did, didn't take the Ark of the Covenant either. Mm. You see, we see them with the Ark of the Covenant. They come to the Jordan River. The Ark's first. Step into the water. The water's dry. Right. They come to that Jericho, that big old walled city. What's leading the way? The Ark of the Covenant. Representing God. But we come to little old AI. Where's the ark? Where's God? Ah, we don't need it. We can do it ourselves. Sometimes that's us. And sometimes that's what leads us into trouble. Here, I'm, we try to live the Christian life. Fight the flesh and the devil in our own power. And we fail time after time. We can't do that. We need to take the time every day to walk in the strength of the Lord. Every day we need to seek God. Every day the first thing we get up is we need to talk to God. We need to get into his scripture as quickly as we can to find out what God's got to say to us. Every day when we are walking with the Lord in his word as we should be, we can be confident in the battles of life we face and, 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 and that God's strength to help us to overcome the enemies. We fail when we fail to utilize the whole armor of God. It talks about it in Ephesians chapter 6. But also we see here a confounded people. You see, after their trouble, after their terrible defeat at the hands of Ai, the people of Israel feeling the same fear that their enemies felt, as we see here in the scriptures. They, they, their fear was like water again. They, they too, you know, they knew how their enemies were feeling. You see, this is the one problem with sin. It will defeat you and leave you feeling just like a lost man. Nothing is right in the life of a believer while there is sin in the midst. It's an awful place to be. It's a miserable feeling. And it's just, I don't like being there. Have you been there, preacher? Absolutely. If you're honest, you'll admit it too. You've been there too. Because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. That's right. What it says. Have you ever had a time like this in your spiritual life? Have you? I, I, I have. Most of the time, they, the results from these times is when I, I have left God out of the picture of my life and I'm trying to do it myself. Israel didn't know at this point what was wrong. All they knew was that they had just suffered a, a defeat, the first defeat. <clears throat> a demoralizing, paralyzing, spiritual strip. The people here, the, their hearts melted with fear and their courage become as liquid as the Bible says here. They could not believe it. We beat big old Jericho and we lost to little Oaya. Because of the defeat, it was immediately apparent that God was no longer behind them and they were confused. It, it created misgivings and a lack of confidence in the, in the Lord. And rather than examine their own lives for the source of defeat, you know, they, they began to doubt the Lord and wonder if the Lord it, it had changed his mind or they misunderstood God's plans and God's word for their life. Joshua and the elders, you know what they decided to do? We better pray. <coughs> 
why do we wait till it goes wrong and then we, we pray? But this was the best idea they've had yet. They fell on their face. They fell on their face. They prostrated, uh, prostrated themselves before God. Now they're doing the right thing. Now they're doing something right. And though the Joshua's major concern was, well, as you see in verse 9, there was the honor of God's name. He feared that the enemy would soon wipe out Israel and, 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 and here they go, ridicule God's name. They would call the Lord weak and powerless, unable to save and deliver his people uh, to, uh, you know, you know, and to fulfill his promises that he made to his people. God's great name and his reputation was at stake. And therefore, above all else, Joshua begged God to protect his own name, to protect the, the strong witness of the Lord before the people of the earth. And when the child of God falls into sin... Now, if you don't hear anything else in my sermon, please listen to me now. Wake up. When a child of God falls into sin, let me tell you what you do. You drag the name of the Lord through the mud. You drag the name of the Lord through the mud. He gets ridiculed. He makes fun, gets made fun of. And the devil loves it when you falter. He loves to drag the name of the Lord through the mud. I'm going to tell you something. How many times... How many times have you dragged the name of the Lord through the mud? I don't know about you, but I don't want the Lord mocked and his name dragged through the mud because of me. Amen. And the only way I can do that is to stay on my knees. I'm telling you that. I like the sign down in my home church. The future looks good from down on your knees. The future looks good down on your knees. I like that. The devil and the world love to mock God when we fail him. My next point, an unbelievable discovery. Verse 10 there, a broken commandment. When Achan did was an outright defiance of God's commandment. The fact that Achan hid the plunder shows that he knew that what he is doing was wrong. <laughs> Same thing with you and me. If we're hiding it, it's got to be wrong. Right. Bring it to the light. We, we don't want nobody else to know about it. It's got to be wrong. That's right. That's right. Achan knew what he was doing was wrong. He hid it after a, a whole day of his his face. God looks down at Joshua and tells him. He always said, Joshua, get up. I like this. Get up, Joshua. I got business to deal with you. Mm -hmm. Get up, Joshua. He said there is sin in the camp, and it has to be dealt with. That's why they did not have the presence of God with them. It seems that most people do not understand that God cannot dwell in the midst of sin. Right. You would be amazed at the people that want to pray to God and ask God for things that are contradictory to his word. It's amazing. Mm, that's right. And I always keep thinking back that I've shared many times that that young man that was shacking up with her girl and she left him and he wanted me to pray that she'd come back and shack up with him some more. That don't happen. No. God, forget that. You need to get saved what I told you. Amen. God is holy, therefore he can dwell only where there is righteousness and purity. His presence and his guidance are not available where there is sin. Folks, you want, you want a blessed life? Get rid of the sin in your life. And if you've got something hiding, deal with it before God. Get it out of the way so you can get God's blessings. We stand alone to struggle against such enemies if there is sin in our lives and the only help available to us is what man can do. And that's not much, but I'm telling you, when they, we need the supernatural power and the help of Almighty God. God's presence and power is available only as we live holy, righteous lives before Almighty God. Now let me repeat that. God's presence and God's power is only available as we live holy, righteous lives before God. 
Sin separates and it cuts us out from God's help and, and God's love. Sin causes failure and defeat. Sin causes us to live lives that are weak and wavering before God. Like the waves ebb and flow. I have come to believe that there is people, denominations and churches that are happy without the presence of Almighty God. Why else? Why else would they let anybody and everybody join their church? The gays, the homosexuals, the transgenders, the unmarried that are shacking up. Why else would they ordain the ungodly to minister? Friend, if you are living an oh holy, ungodly life, I would not let you join this church. Why, preacher? Because I want the presence and the power of Almighty God in this place. Amen. That's why. I believe this is one of the biggest problems in the world today, sin in the camp, sin in God's people. And I think most Christians do not take their, uh, this very seriously because they say to themselves, you know, I, I'm saved, it'll be all right, uh, I got nothing to fear. Friend, I will tell you something. Friend, is your life will bring, uh, a sin in your life will bring that your life to a dead stop spiritually. There's so many people say, Preacher, I, I don't feel as close to God as I used to be. Wonder why. Come on now. Wonder why. No joy, no growth, no victory. If you if you can be sin, uh, 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 it, it, it can be sin that, that no one else knows about. And, and you think you've got it all covered up and it's not hurting anybody. I want to tell you something. It's a big problem. That sin will bring your spiritual life to a dead stop. Sin always leads to failure, defeat, when fighting against the enemy of the world. Say it. God wants his people to have the victory, not defeat. Listen to me, friend. Church person, Christian, if you've got sin in your life, you've got something going on you're trying to hide, God does not want you to live a defeated life. He wants you to get right. My next point this terrible effect we see in verse 8, O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their back before their enemies? Israel's failure brought dishonor upon Israel's God. And even today our failures hurt the reputation of the church, of Christianity, and of God himself. Our failure, like Joshua and Israel's, should cut us to the heart when we know that by those failures our master is dishonored. How we should bow our hearts to the dust, confounded and ashamed, saying, Oh Lord, what shall I say? Our failures, the believer's failures, shall humble us for the... They bring dishonor to God. And if past failures does not bring humbling and self-searching before God, we will never find out the true source of power. We'll be missing out on God's power. Sin also affects others. The whole nation of Israel suffered for the small, unknown sin of an insignificant person. When you sin, there are always consequences. Amen. Someone always suffers. And no one's sin is ever just his own business alone. It always affects others. We see it all the time. I can only imagine the impact on those 36 families, those 36 men that died, their families, what, the, what they were going through, the heartache, the trouble, the pain. Why? Because this man sinned. This man called Achan disobeyed God. And he brought suffering to others. I'm going to tell you something. We see it all the time. In many various forms. Anybody that's a drunk or a drug addict, should, I'm telling you, it affects their family. Amen. 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 Blowing their money on gambling and their children going hungry. There's so much that's happening in our, in our day. We're, we're, I'm telling you. I remember being in Forest City. This young man was a straight-A student. He was a good student. And his mom and dad got a divorce. And he went from a straight student student to a troublemaker. <laughs> to a troublemaker. Causing problems in the school. Went from the top to the bottom. Why? Because mom and daddy couldn't get along. 
holding my own grandbaby in my arms and said, Papa, why can't mom and daddy live together? Mm. It has consequences. I remember. You see, sin corrupts, and what it does is it affects everything around it. I, I remember reading an article years ago. Yeah, we're going to go over again today. Don't worry about it. Preach on, brother. I remember reading an article years ago about a little church that was fussing and fighting. Couldn't keep a preacher long. Just everything was always in a turmoil in that little church. Until one day they decided that they're going to remodel the pulpit, the, the, the altar. And they tore into that thing and what they found. Some devil had took Playboy books and stuck them up under mm -hmm. the altar. Right under the pulpit. <clears throat> no wonder that church could not function. And be led in the spirit of God felt there. Some devil had cursed that place. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, your sins don't just affect you, but everybody around you. Your sins has consequences. Your sins will affect your family and this church family. I remember talking to a pastor several years ago. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, I've lost 11 families this year. He's left the church, 11. He said, what happened? He said, divorce. Mom and daddy got divorced, and they just scattered to the wind. 11 whole families out of my church. That's a lot of people. If you sin, there's consequences. Your prayers will go unanswered. God cannot bless your home. God will not bless your kids. God will not bless your job. And it certainly can hamper the spirit of your church. My friend, sin causes problems. It causes problems for the sinner and for everybody else around them. The fact is most of us are guilty of being like Achan from time to time. When we allow sin into our lives and when we try to hide our sins and try to cover it up, we bring pain and trouble into our lives. Yes, we all are achings from time to time. And when we are, our sins cause aching in our hearts and our lives. Hidden sin is like hiding ter or hidden termites in your house. You don't see them. You don't see them, but they're eating away on the foundation of your house. You don't know it until it's too late. You That's, right. That's what sin does. It eats the foundation out from under you. Look at Jonah and see how his sin affected those soldiers when he boarded that ship. Many stories we could look at. It's root is desire, my next point. One man's desire. When I saw him on the spoils, he said, Goodly Babylonian's, uh, Babylonian's garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weighed. Then I covered them and I took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. This verse shows us the four steps of Achan's hidden sin. You see, he saw it, he covered it, he took it, and he concealed it. Sin often begins with a look. Eve saw the fruit. Lot saw the watered plains. David saw Bathsheba bathing. But Achan's sin lay not in seeing the gold. He couldn't help but to see it, but he coveted them. He loved the forbidden again until desire moved his hand to take it. Crouching at the door. The pleasures of sin will always attract us more when we look on them with a desire. This is where Satan works his best, his most profound work. He knows your weakness. He attacks those and strokes the fire of desire in us until we covet that forbidden thing. That forbidden pleasure. We need to guard our hearts closely because certain circumstances might bring ruinous results if ever thought is not captured by the Lord. Achan desired 
defines his legacy. Third main point, an unnecessary end. You see Achan's opportunity here. Why did God not just reveal the man's identity to Joshua? Instead of going through the process of elimination, the answer is in that this method would impress upon the nation of Israel the seriousness of sin. You see, again, I speak of this. We live in a time of grace, and I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people do not take serious sin. That's right. Church people do not take the seriousness of sin. So everybody had to come before Joshua. I can just imagine what they thought was going on. You know, we see there in the scripture that he tells them that, uh, you know, to, to sanctify themselves. There in verse 13. So I believe here is the opportunity to Achan to get things right and, and just maybe, just maybe I believe that God would have spared his life and the life of his family. Sanctify yourself. What does that mean? Search yourself. Get yourself right. Clean up your act. Repent. Sanctify yourself. I believe also, I believe it was to give the guilty person an opportunity to repent and confess. But I wondered, as, as each one of them, Joshua said, sanctify yourself. Tomorrow you're coming before me. Some, somebody's done something wrong. And I bet every single one of them people was thinking, Lord, was it me? Was it me? If God was to come down right now in our midst and look at this congregation and say, sanctify yourselves, you're all coming before me tomorrow. One of you has sinned. Every single one of us would be trembling in our tracks. Lord, is it me? Did I do the wrong, Lord? Do you have hidden sin today? You got something going on in your life that you don't want your wife to know about, your husband to know about, your family to know about, your church to know about, your community to know about. I don't want to bust your bubble, but here it goes. God already knows it. Amen. It's not hid from him. We should know that Achan, yeah, he confessed his sin. He confessed, but it was after he was backed into the corner. When he was pointed out, what now happened was dramatic, a drama that stands as a great warning to Israel and to all succeeding generations. The judgment had already been pronounced. The accursed thing was to be destroyed. I don't want to be in the eyes of God an accursed thing. In this case, the accursed thing was the man aching himself. It, was, it, it had been his sin that had uh, caused the judgment of God to fall on the Israelites and the sin that costed 36 men their lives. The justice and the judgment of God had been executed. Achan and his family and all of their possessions were taken outside the camp. They were stoned. They were burned. They were piled up rocks upon them. And the place there was called Achor, which means trouble. Everything was burned. This was a symbol of purifying and cleansing the evil from the sin from among the people. Achan lost his life, condemned his family to death because he took something that was dedicated to the Lord for his own house. <laughs> hmm. That might be an encouragement to tithe, wouldn't it? <laughs> Belongs to him. Amen. The problem with us, we generally have such a tame view of sin. We need to fear the contagious power of sin and its effects. My next point, our opportunity. If you are lost in your sin today, I have good news for you. You do not have to die in your sins. Jesus paid that sin debt on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Jesus paid your debt. The wages of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God didn't play around in the Old Testament. But now we're living under grace. 
you still don't need to be playing around with sin. If you are God's child and you have sin in your life that has not been confessed and that you have not uh, repented of, you need to come that now and know that your life is being a hindrance to the work of God, to your family, to the family of God. You also need to know that God will chasten you if you're his child. And I don't know about you, but I've never liked spankings. <laughs> and especially from God. If you're a child of God, you will understand what I'm about to say. But if you've never felt this, you better check up on your salvation. Because I want to tell you something. When I come to realize I've done something wrong, it is the most horrible feeling you could ever possible go through. My heart hurts. I'm just, everything's out of place. Until I get it back. It just feels awful. It's terrible. When the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh, buddy, you done wrong. Uh-uh, buddy, you better get it right. You better come before God. You better repent. And I'm going to tell you something. John come preaching repentance. Jesus come preaching repentance. People don't want to hear it no more. Right. You are a sinner. Accept it. Repent. Always. Every day. So I'm going to tell you something. God's going to do what he has to do to get our attention if you're his child. My advice to you is to get right with God today. God knows what it will take to touch your heart. And he isn't afraid to touch the heart strings in your life. He knows what can bring you down. Friend, sin, never escape the watchful eye of God. Psalms 139 says, or Numbers 23, uh, excuse me, 32, 23 says, remember, uh, reminds us of this, be sure your sins will find you out. Amen. Be sure your sins will find you out. We need to be thankful. God doesn't deal with disobedience today the same way he did in those events. Aren't you glad? And this week, this little girl was smart mouth and dad. And then Alexa Mesa says, tell her she needs to honor her father and mother. And I looked at her and I said, do you realize that if you were back in the biblical days, back when Jesus walked the earth, that your daddy would have the right to stone you for your rebellion, for your dishonor to him? And her eyes got blue. Her eyes grew. I said, it's right. The Bible says to honor your father and your mother that your life will be what? Long. Are you listening, young people? Don't you be smart mouthing your mom and dad. Don't you be talking back. Don't you be an ugly. And by the way, if you got elderly parents, that's talking to you too. Amen. Better be good to them. Amen? Amen. That's right. Listen to me. Jesus takes sin very serious. Do you? This man, Achan, did something very wrong. He went against God's commandments and he brought turmoil on the whole nation of Israel. I'm telling you, your life and the things that you do wrong will bring turmoil on your life, your family, and even can bring it in the walls of this church. Do you want that? Sin is serious business. If you're lost without Jesus right now, your sins are going to take you to hell. Not anything else, but your sins. You can get rid of those if you'll come to the altar at the foot of the cross of Jesus and confess those sins and ask him to forgive you and to come into your heart. They'll be left. Your slate will be wiped clean. Hallelujah. I love that, don't you? Amen. I love that. Never get over your salvation. <clears throat> Don't let your salvation just become undrawn. Man, that's praise God for it every day. Amen. You're going to go to heaven Amen. because of what God does. But if you're here today and you're a Christian and you've got something going on in your life that you know is a no-no, 
I'm telling you, you're not living, you're, you're, you're being robbed of the joy, the spirit of God, the power of God, the love of God in your life. Uh, God's not going to be working on your behalf. Why? Because there's a wall of sin between you and him, and you need to deal with it. You don't have to tell me, but you better talk to him. If there's something going on in your life, child of God, I wouldn't leave this place until I got it right with God. As we stand the same this morning. Sin is serious business in the eyes of a mother. <clears throat> Hymn number 571. <laughs> How are you today? this sentence for me. God takes sin seriously. seriously. Don't forget that. Don't forget that when you're tempted to sin. If you got sin in your life now, don't forget that. Get it right with God. Get rid of it. Don't let it hamper your joy and your walk with God. Please don't. Please don't. God wants to bless you. God wants to give you victory every day. Any word before we dismiss? Anybody have anything they'd like to share? Yeah, just how senseless, if you just look at this for a second, how senseless this sin in this story is. Is Aiken going to wear that garment down to the market? Yeah. People are going to be like, where'd you get that from? Yeah. And where's he going to spend money? Right. <laughs> it's senseless. It comes through our abundance. Adam and Eve had everything in the garden they lacked from that one tree. Out of the abundance came from their sin. They yeah. went straight to what they didn't have. That's right. That's right. That's right. It kind of reminds me of the story of a preacher. Why they play hooky from church to self. They got somebody else to preach. He wouldn't play golf. The Lord gave him some hole in one. The said, why did they do that? Well, preacher, you know, who are you going to tell?